getting us started. Thank you. Hello everyone, this is Camille Fairborn from Utah State University and I'd like to welcome you to today's cause teaching and learning webinar. I'm pleased to introduce to you Bill Finzer as our speaker today. Bill is a senior scientist at the Concord Consortium, which is a nonprofit educational research and development organization that works in the field of science, math, and engineering education. He led the Fathom Dynamic Data Software Development Team at KCP Technologies before coming to the Concord Consortium, and now he leads the Common Online Data Analysis Platform, CODAP, project with support from the National Science Foundation. He's going to talk today about CODAP and show us what it can do. The way the webinars work is that all listeners are muted during the webinar. You can ask questions at any time by typing them into the question box, and I'll be sure to ask those questions either during the webinar or towards the end to give Bill a chance to respond. You can also use the chat box if you are having any technical issues, and I can chat to you through there. So at this point, I'll turn things over to William Finzer. Bill, go ahead. Well, thank you, Camille. It's really great to be here. Um, thanks for inviting me, and I'm glad to have this opportunity to show and tell and talk and answer questions about the Common Online Data Analysis Platform. So um, I don't have very many slides. Most of this is going to be de demo, a screen sharing demo. Um, and I encourage you to ask questions at any time, and Camille will be monitoring those, and uh, she'll let me know if you have questions. I won't be able to see them, uh, at least while I'm doing the slideshow. Maybe later on I will be able to. So, um, as Camille mentioned, I led the Fathom de development project for many years, and uh, I'm closely associated with the Tinkerplots um, project, which uh, Cliff Canold led, and as some of you may know, Fathom and Tinkerplots share a common software framework or platform. Uh, at some point, we made the decision to move to the web, and we got funding from the National Science Foundation for this project, which is in its third year. CODAP is free, it's browser-based, it's open source, and it is a web application, which means it feels a bit like a desktop application, feels a bit like Google Docs, it doesn't feel like a website. Um, now, it, an interesting thing about CODAP is that, unlike Fathom, we're not developing it as a product to be used in the classroom, we're developing it as a platform for use by other development projects to develop stuff to be used in the classroom. However, it is now usable in the classroom, as you'll see, with some uh, limitations um, be because of stuff that we haven't developed yet. But you'll get a sense of that as I do the demo. Um, and uh, whereas Fathom was really uh, aimed at being a, a, an environment for use in mathematics and statistics, CODAP has had uh, uh, a focus on science education, and it's not yet a full-fledged uh, statistics learning environment. But it's going to turn into that over time, especially with a new project that's starting up in the fall. Uh, with Holly Lynn Stoll Lee at uh, North Carolina State University. She got funding to um, develop some online materials for teacher professional development uh, using CODAP, and that's in the area of statistics, and so we'll be fleshing out the statistics capabilities of CODAP. Okay, so um, uh, going back to the title page, you might have noticed uh, this, um, oops, this um, link here, and if you write that down somewhere, then you can use it at any time to go to this slide presentation. And the nice thing about the being able to go to the slide presentation is, actually, Camille, if you would write that, is, is there a way, place you can put that where people can see it? I don't know, but if there were, that would be good. Yes, I'll put that in the questions box. 
Oh, that's great. Okay, and uh, the, the, the main utility of this presentation is these links, I believe. And uh, so I'm going to, um, uh, uh, I think I'm going to stop the presentation. Uh, exit there. And you're probably seeing my screen now. And um, I'm going to uh, open some of these links and use them as uh, something to talk about. So the um, CODAP project site is part of Concord. And um, here we have uh, a lot of information about CODAP. And uh, if you have not seen this video, which was entered in the STEM for all video showcase that the National Science Foundation uh, sponsored. This, it's only three minutes long and it gives a nice overview. And if you like what you see today, uh, it, it's a great way to uh, share with other, other people uh, what CODAP is. <clears throat> now, um, I'm going to launch CODAP in a new tab. Yes, that worked. Good. And um, you can right away see that, uh, first of all, we're running in a browser window. Um, but it asks us about uh, creating a new document or opening uh, a document or browsing examples. So that's unlike a normal web page. It's really a web application. And notice that you didn't have to log in. Um, you can just use it. Um, and. Um, I think I'll start by uh, looking at the example documents, but notice there are other places that you can put documents and open them later, and it'll become clear in a moment uh, what we mean by a document. So um, I'm going to just ch uh, choose this Markov game document, open it up, and uh, this game uh, came from a prior project called the Data Games Project. And uh, I'm not going to uh, actually play the game or um, use the game in a teaching sense, but um, the idea is that this uh, game, which is uh, kind of dropped into CODAP, so you can drop things into CODAP that generate data. And as I play the game, never mind how you play the game, um, data actually gets generated. And if I make a graph and um, put uh, Markov's previous two moves down here and Markov's move here, this is the standard setup for this game. And now as I continue to play, and I'm, of course I'm playing blindly and I lost, and then I'll make a new game, um, you can see the data getting generated. So that's uh, kind of that's one way that data gets into CODAP is by having something embedded in CODAP that generates data. Now I'm going to show you another way, and uh, to do that, I will make a new document. And on my desktop, I have a uh, new document. Create new document. There we go. I have a text file. Now this could be a comma separated values text file CSV or this happens to be tab delimited doesn't really matter and I drag it into CODAP so I'm dragging something from my desktop I'm dropping it in the browser window and there's the data so this is data that consists of mammals um, and uh, if I make a graph um, the graph comes up with the points scattered because I haven't said where I would like them to locate themselves, but I could do that by uh, dragging height, for example, to the x-axis or the y-axis. So I'll drag it to the x-axis, and there we have a distribution of height. And if I uh, make another graph and uh, say I put uh, diet here, I get uh, a stacked dot plot of um, the diet. 
And for those of you who are accustomed to Fathom or Tinker Plots, then you won't be surprised to see that when I select data in one representation, like clicking on this dot, I can see it also selected in the other representations. And you might not, you might not also be surprised if I show you I can drag this data point, but when I lo let go, the data point goes back to where it uh, was. And if I put the mean and the median, here's a kind of a standard Fathom Tinkerplots demo, uh, and I take one of these points and I drag it, you can see the mean changing, but uh, the median not changing. And if I drag over the median, the median changes as well. So there's uh, dynamic interact. There's interaction, and with uh, most things that you see in CODAP. I'd like to stop there just for a second and see if there are any questions so far. Camille, you'll tell me if you if anything pops up. Um, just to verify, the person who got the professional development grant for the statistics, that was Holly Lynn Stoll Lee, right? That's correct. Uh -huh. Okay. That's the only question we've had so far. Does anyone else want to ask anything at this point? Just type it into the questions window. Okay, so um, just let me know if something comes up there. And I'm going to go back to my um, link here. So uh, just to look briefly at these other um, links that I um, showed here. Code app help, I could click on this link and go to help. Or if I go back to uh, the Code app document where I was working, help shows up over here. So um, I click and here's a um, kind of a portal to the to the web um, that has uh, help, and um, there's help about tables and graphs and maps. Wow. Okay. So if I say I want help about tables, I get a little video and uh, probably some uh, written stuff down below too. So I'm, I hope you're getting the idea that you could use this for some purposes in the classroom as it is. Oh, and that it's free, and it's probably most useful for data exploration as opposed to um, data analysis. So, for example, there's no t-test here, and you can't make a histogram yet, but uh, these things are coming along, especially as we um, work with Holly Lynn in the fall. So that's help. And now if I go back here and I say, oh, I already talked about this video showcase. Um, we do have thing. a couple of questions here. Go ahead. Go um, for it. Can you display the values of the mean and the median or other statistics that are added to a plot? Excellent That's question. From Robert Delmar. And as you see, when I hover over these, they show up. That's great. And, and then you, another question was, can we drop Excel files into CODAP? Um, you would need to export them as CSV, and okay. then you can drop them in. Okay? That's great. Thank you. Okay. Um, now, I wanted to show an example. That's interesting. Of uh, something just changed. There. Okay. Um, of a different way that CODAP is being used. So I'm going to go to this link. And this is just an ordinary web page that has some examples on it. And I think I'll use this example. <clears throat> there we go. And um, Again, just an ordinary web page, but right in here, we have a little, it's like a little piece of code app, uh, no toolbar, but a graph, and we can uh, select things in it. And if I click on the graph, I get this inspector panel that I can use for things like putting in a movable line. 
So if I put in that movable line, then I can eyeball uh, a fit to that. And you'll notice that the interface, those of you who are familiar with Fathom, it's pretty much identical to Fathom's interface. Um, and um, so you can eyeball a fit. Now you might say, but don't you want a least squares fit? And the answer is, yes, I would really like one. But nobody has asked for that among our collaborators yet who are science people and not math stat people. And so we haven't done it yet. But again, when we work with Holly Lynn in the fall, um, that will show up here as uh, a least squares line. So uh, I wanted to show you that. And lastly, I'm going to show you this page of um, additional examples. And all of these examples um, have what we call a uh, data interactive in them, like the Markov game that we saw first. And I am going to launch this. This particular example, don't be an error, please. Oh, that's, um, that's another feature of CODAP in its current state, is that there are bugs, because it's in development. And I think that will fix that. Let's see. No, it didn't. So I'm going to close that. And I'm going to take this link. Here's my unpad. I'm going to make a new document. And go back here to this link. And I'm going to drag this link. No, I'm not. I'm going to drag this link into my untitled document and let go. And it worked that time. Fantastic. So here we have something that's kind of like the Markov game, except what it really is is an interface to a lot of data that um, uh, is gathered about four different C uh, creatures. And it's track data. So if I come in here and I say, I want to have some elephant seals, then if I make a table, I can see that um, I have some I have three elephant seals, and I have a bunch of measurements. And notice that there's latitude and longitude. So the great thing about having latitude and longitude is that if I put a map in, then those points get plotted. Um, and if I select one of these points, then I scroll to it. So that's the measurement of a particular position, depth, etc., for an elephant seal, in fact, that elephant seal um, at a particular um, time. So this is um, very interesting data for a marine biology class. Maybe not so interesting for a statistics class unless you start looking at um, some of the other attributes that are here. For example, depth. So I think this would be a great question to put in to a statistics class in the first part of the course. How would you characterize this distribution? And one would hope that at some point students would say, oh my god, it's bimodal, and wonder what is going on with those two peaks. And you can select one and see that the, where, it's, where it is over here. But you don't really, there's an investigation to be had there. And I wish I had an answer about why the depth data for elephant seals is bimodal. And the truth is, I don't have an answer. Um, before I pause again for questions, I want to uh, add some white sharks to this. OK, now. Um, 
So I've mixed together the white shark data and the elephant seal data. And there are two things I can do. One is I could just drag uh, species to the y-axis. And now I've separated them. So I've got the elephant seals separated from the white sharks. Notice I've got undo. That's an important thing that you don't necessarily expect to get in a web application. And my mouse just died. Um, but um, I want to show you this thing. If I take species and drag it to the left, oh, I have to do this first. Yes, I'm sure. Close it. Um, if I drag species to the left, I can actually drag, I can drop it to the left of everything, and that makes three levels to the hierarchy. A species level, a track level, and what do we call these things over here? Samples. We could call them measurements, I guess. But um, you can see uh, that the, the data in CODAP is hierarchical, not flat. And that turns out to have really important and interesting ramifications uh, for working with uh, larger data sets, um, especially larger than we often work with in a statistics class. So Camille, any questions that have gathered up there? Not yet, but if anyone has some, please go ahead and answer or ask them in the questions window. Okay, um, so back to my cheat sheet here, otherwise known as slides. Ah, yes, there is another data interactive that I wanted to show you. Here they are. And the particular one is down here at the bottom, which is uh, called a sampler. And there is a question here. Um, yeah. With the hierarchy in the, is that in both in the table and the graph and the map level? They all work together seamlessly. So you can change the hierarchy and the right things happen in the graph and the map. For example, um, let me undo that last thing that I did. And notice I have six tracks now. So if I make a graph and I put species into the, onto the x-axis, I get six points because I have three elephant seal tracks and three white shark tracks. But now I'm going to take a chance here and put this over here. And yes, the right thing happened. Now I just have two points because there are only two species. So notice how the graph is responding to the structure of the data. I hope that answered that question. I think it did. Um, another one just came in. What is done to set up the maps to match the latitude and longitude values? Ah, simply having an attribute that um, has a name sort of like latitude and longitude. So it could be with a capital L, or it could be just lat and long. Uh, we've got, we check for a bunch of possible uh, ways that you might put this attribute name in there. And CODAP looks to see if the, there are such attributes. And if there are, then it plots those cases as points. That is really amazing. And um, how many levels can you have to the data? I think we've only tried up to four or five, but there isn't any built-in limit. Okay. Usually it doesn't make sense to have more than three or four, but there might be circumstances in which it does. Okay. Okay, back to, I get to do one more thing, don't I? One more thing, and then we're probably about out of time. <laughs> okay, good. Uh, so somewhere, I guess I just press it again. Uh, here's the sampler. And I see where that is. And I come here and I want a new thing. And now I'm going to drag the sampler. There, there are other ways to do this thing than I'm doing it, but this is the way I know best. 
I'm going to drag it over here and drop it. And this is a very simple little statistics simulation. Uh, you can change these things. So I've got some people and they have heights and the mean of the population is that and uh, in centimeters and the standard deviation is that and I'm going to choose samples of size 7 and I'm going to choose 11 of them. So I generate the samples and there they are in a table. I make a graph and there are the heights of, the in, of all the things that I gathered. But if I drag sample here, oh, I got a scatter plot. I don't really want a scatter plot. I want, uh, I want this to be treated as categorical. And now I've got distributions, right? Uh, and I could put the mean in here, right? And now I can see the, uh, begin to see the sampling distribution of the mean. And if I come over here and I say, I want a new attribute in samples, which I'll call mean of sample and uh, call it mean of height. Now I get a new, oh, I did it wrong, undo. It's probably going to break now. I put it in the wrong place. I want the new attribute in people. So mean height and mean of height. Now I get these means here, and the last thing I'm going to do is make a graph of those means. So there is my sampling distribution, and if I generate more samples, then I get um, more points, too. So I'm watching my sampling distribution being generated. Maybe. I'm not sure that worked the way it was supposed to, but I'm out. Right? Uh, yes, we are close to the end of the half an hour. Are there any other questions people would like to ask? And while we're waiting for them, I did have one myself. Yeah. Um, so we can use these kinds of things and create our own documents mm -hmm. right now. Is that what you're saying? Yes, and, and I can show you that, but you can come over here and say, I want to save this. And you can save it in an account you could set up on the Concord site. Or, if you have a Google Drive account, you can save it right in your Google Drive. And then we can share that link to the Google Doc. And oh, it's have better than that. Like, yeah. Oh, Look, show here. me, please. <laughs> you can say share and get a link to a shared view. And notice I haven't even saved this. Wow. So, I'm going to enable sharing and then copy this thing. And... Let's see, I should be able to chat that somewhere, right? Um, yes, if you can get a hold of the chat window, you can put that in there. I don't know if Did I can it, copy oh, it. Oh, it's set to organizers. I just, oh, I want let me to see. I can fix that. Okay, good. So that link will take you to this document, even though I haven't saved it. So anything that is that we create here would get automatically hosted or held on that code app server then? It's more complicated than that. <laughs> okay. But it's also simpler than that. You don't have to worry. All right. Um, the other thing you can do uh, is to download it. And let me give it a name. Uh, sampling demonstration. And then I say I want to download it. And this will put it on my desktop or wherever my downloads go. And uh, now I've saved it on my own computer. And if I go, let me make a new, uh, there's a new document. I go to my uh, downloads folder. There it is, and I drag it in, and boom, that's right where we were. That's great. A um, couple other questions. Can you visualize multivariate data? Yes, we can. Let's see you, if we can. Go you ahead. did say that you were going to add histograms this fall, right? I said that we're going to be working with Holly Lynn, and I 
should say that if she wants histograms, we will add them. So we should invite Holly Lynn and say, Holly Lynn, let's have histograms. <laughs> yeah, that's kind of what you would do. So let's put day here and temperature on the y-axis. And um, let's put depth in the middle. So now I've got three variables. I think I should make the points a little bit smaller. And so the dark colors are the um, closer to the surface things, I guess. So you can see three there. I can also, uh, let me get rid of depth. Um, I can drag, I could drag depth to the other y-axis and make a plot of, uh, that had two variables against x. So multivariate, but that's, we don't have any 3D plots, etc. You can okay. also drag um, uh, an attribute like species into the map, and then it'll color the points by the species. Wow, <laughs> that's really impressive. You're the right kind of moderator, Camille. <laughs> Very enthusiastic. Um, yes, this will be available to rewatch as a recording on the web, on the CAUSE website when we're finished. Are there any other questions? Well, I have a question. Okay. Um, what did you find most interesting? If you could just type some response into the chat window, that would give me some feedback. Well, I personally really like how intuitive it is and how I think students could come in and just kind of start clicking around and figuring it out almost on their own, which I know younger students especially like to do. They don't like to read long instructions. Mm -hmm. We hope that's the case. We have done classroom testing um, at the high school level, and we've done uh, interviews, uh, usability testing at both high school and middle school. And uh, though there are plenty of rough edges, uh, we are confident that middle and high school students can fairly quickly uh, start making good use of this for exploring data. And I hope that came across that we're not yet uh, a statistics environment. So we've got some co uh, comments back. Uh, Andrew Ross says, I'm playing with fast plants. How do you see the code behind the simulation? I've also played with the parachutes code in the past and had the same trouble. I wanted to see what was going on behind the scenes. Ah, well, that, uh, let's see, I must still have one up here. So um, you could be asking, how do I see the code that makes Markov go? And uh, you'd have to talk to the developer of the Markov game. Um, I guess that's me. But, uh, <laughs> no, anyway and uh, ask them to see the code. But there is no, um, no transparent window into the code behind one of these data interactives. That's not quite true, actually. I guess if you're a web developer, you could inspect this, and you would actually see the, um, the JavaScript uh, programming that was done to make it happen. That was kind right. of a funny answer to that question, wasn't it? <laughs> got some other uh, good feedback. People said they, they liked the multivariate presentation of the data. They liked the sampling distribution example and also the mean versus median. I also thought that looked like a good thing for students to play with. Mm -hmm. um, Megan Mako said, I like the ease of looking at three variables. David Doan said the cloud sharing feature was interesting. Mm -hmm. Peter Pedro said he liked the exploratory nature of it. And Larry Oslin said, I will use this for my college students to play with different variables. I like the dynamic, dynamic aspects of the data with charts and maps. Uh, Inet Gill said, data hierarchies. Um, yeah. mm -hmm. Good. Like the mapping, and I can, I can actually copy some of these for you if you'd like later and send them to you. Oh, I would love that. I didn't, uh, I'm surprised no one asked, how do we enter data from scratch? Like, can't I come up here to the table and um, you know enter some data? 
And the answer is in mostly no, um, because we haven't implemented that yet, not because we don't think it's a good idea. We just nobody that we're working with has asked for that. But it is possible, if I make a new attribute, uh, example, data, entry, uh, and I'm not going to give it a formula. Now I have a new column over here, and I could uh, enter data right here. But the data ent entry at, at present is very primitive, um, and that remains something to be done. Okay. Uh, Robert Delmas wants to know if there are plans to add. <laughs> he wants to know if there are plans to add samplers, modeling capabilities like Tinker Plots. In fact, Holly Lynn's highest priority is to make a sampler like Tinker Plots in Codeapp. So there will be funds for that. Okay. That's great. All right, are there any other questions? Well, thank you all very much. It was a pleasure to be able to show this very much in progress project and uh, to get a sense that uh, some of you at least would like to begin using it. Stay it's tuned. Go ahead. Stay tuned. It's going to get better with time. All right, thank you so much for sharing this with us today, and thanks to all of the attendees for attending. I'd like to encourage you to also attend the next activity webinar two weeks from today on June 28th, where Kyle Cottle will discuss using Hunger Games data to teach randomization tests, and that sounds like fun. So again, thanks to all of you for coming. Thanks to Bill for sharing his project with us today, and we hope to see you next time. Thank you.